Chapter 20, The Stoic Goron Ghost The Legend of Sunset Shimmer, Majora's Mask By Ganondorf 8 August 8, 2016 Chapter 20, The Stoic Goron Ghost Even though I knew that the smithies would allow us to get out of the cold and into the warmth, I was hesitant to go inside over who lived there. Someone inside clearly had a bad attitude given he told someone else to keep quiet, but it was the other voice that sent a chill down my spine. What kind of person or creature for that matter could make a noise that horrible, that putrid? My journey through Termina had already introduced me to characters that I had never seen before, but perhaps those encounters were nothing compared to what awaited in this region along with the other two. I shouldn't be surprised by this revelation. I had read the Hyrule Historia why Rainbow Dash ordered it and never bothered to read it still escaped me and learned the unfortunate truth behind Termina's creation. Twilight had insisted on me telling her about it, and who was I to deny Her Highness the knowledge that she craved it couldn't help her further her friendship lessons other than get an earful from her later. According to the book, the great goddesses of Hyrule, Din, Nero, and Faro Rey, created Termina accidentally which explains why they have no influence in this world. When the three created what became Hyrule, their power spread throughout the cosmos touching every last fabric of existence, yet their excess energy seeped into unseen cracks within the fabric giving birth to alternate realities. Termina, had never been intended to be created by the great goddesses. They didn't even know it existed and probably still don't and so they left it to fend for itself never once acknowledging its existence. It did explain then why no one around here knew about the Triforce or the rise of Ganondorf, or even the existence of the royal family of Hyrule. Because this world was never touched by the goddesses, the four giants assumed the mantle by swearing to act as guardians to protect Termina from evil. I couldn't even begin to imagine where they came from or why they were chosen, but perhaps someone knew of such legends. It may or may not be useful in getting everything back to normal, but sometimes such knowledge proved invaluable in case you needed to know about it. After waiting a couple of minutes in front of the door of the smithies, Twilight bopped me on the head several times urging me to do something. As a fairy, she didn't feel the effects of the cold air swirling about, but I wasn't as fortunate. Whoever designed this game clearly had no idea about how people trudge about in these conditions. I mean seriously, who walks around in a frozen wasteland wearing nothing but a green tunic? Maybe the actual hero could survive in these conditions, but I'm someone who prefers to wrap up accordingly to survive the winter months. Knowing that standing outside meant freezing to death I wish I had a Goron tunic I reached for the doorknob, turned it, opened the door, and walked inside before brushing off some loose snow on my body. The interior of the smithies wasn't surprising apart from a ridiculously large sword hanging on one of the walls. Whoever could wield a weapon that big must either be pretty strong or downright crazy for wasting their money acquiring it. To my left was a furnace that looked retro in design yet a chunk of ice was preventing it from working properly. To my right was someone laying down on a couch but I couldn't see their face from this position. All in all, it was pretty cozy aside from a couple of oddities here and there. Look at that furnace over there, Sunset. Twilight said. It certainly does look rustic. I said. You don't see many in that design back in Equestria these days. Oh? Have ponies achieved new advances in technology? I asked. Twilight rolled her eyes knowing full well that I had made a joke about how the world I call my home gained new technological marvels almost every other day while Equestria achieves something similar several times every couple of years. Sorry, please continue. Back home, ponies have been using more modern designs that consume less fuel but can produce the same quality. Yet this furnace isn't working. Let me take a closer look. Twilight suggested, floating in front of me to inspect the ice. She looked at it from different angles for a few moments before floating back over with her head held down low. That ice doesn't look like it will melt anytime soon. I mean, it can be melted but I don't think you have the means to melt it right now. What would I need? A simple magic spell could easily get rid of the ice, but then we're in a world where equestrian magic doesn't work, and you haven't acquired any new magic. No, I think this will require the direct approach. Twilight answered. And that would be... Hot water. Can't get any more direct than that. I said sarcastically. The only question is where can we find hot water in such frigid conditions? I doubt the smithy has any otherwise they would have melted the ice by now, but if we ask them some questions, we might get some answers and quite possibly help them out. I'm sure they would appreciate you doing that for. Twilight said before suddenly going deathly silent as though something had freaked her out. Twilight? 
Are you okay? I asked, waving my hand in front of her. There was no reaction. I then saw the expression on her face, stone silent and staring dead ahead. I then looked in the same direction and my entire body froze. There was a counter at the other end of the room, but it was who was standing on the other side of it that froze me to the core. A large bare-chested muscular figure wearing something on his face that resembled a mask it looked more like leather straps bound across his face reinforced with small nails and covered the right side of said face and nothing but a ragged pair of shorts, but it was the large horns protruding on either side of his head combined with the red skin that was an instant giveaway. Twilight was shocked over seeing the one person who almost brought Equestria to its knees, yet I was shocked that this is what he had been reduced to. Tyrek! Twilight exclaimed. Sure enough, the large hulking figure was none other than Tyrek, who had portrayed Ganondorf himself in my previous journey. It definitely felt weird seeing him here of all places and wearing nothing but ragged shorts, but Termina had proven to be filled with all kinds of surprises. In Tyrek's hand was a large hammer that was most likely used to forge metal due to the nature of this business, yet the weirdest thing was that he just stood there like he was staring into thin air. What in the world is he doing here? Wasn't he banished or something, Sunset? He was but I guess this is a different version of him. I think it's obvious that he was the one who made that noise when you were standing outside. It just feels so weird seeing Tyrek reduced to this. You never saw what he did to Equestria, did you? Twilight asked. I shook my head. I had only ever heard about what he did when Her Highness and I first started sending messages back and forth to each other upon finally accepting each other as friends and her personally as my teacher. I know that I only gave you vague hints at what Tyrek did to your fellow ponies, but my aim involved protecting you in case you decided to get revenge or something. Tyrek drained the magic from every pony in a bid for power but he was undone when we unlocked the Chest of Harmony and released the Rainbow Power. Rainbow power? Did you seriously call it that? I asked. Her Highness had told me that she and the pony, versions of my friends gained ridiculously long manies as well as their cutie marks appearing on their hooves. I just couldn't grasp the fact that she experienced such an extreme transformation. It's a power we've only used once and hoping never again anytime soon. By the way, who do you suppose was telling Tyrek to keep quiet? Maybe that guy sleeping on the couch over there. Twilight asked. I slapped my forehead knowing that I walked into that one. I took a few steps forward so that I could get a better look at who had been talking to Tyrek, and I wasn't nearly as surprised as Her Highness was her jaw dropped when she saw who the other smithy was, but I felt it was an improvement over what I saw from him last time. Sleeping on the couch was fancy pants, and while he certainly looked less than glamorous he was wearing a blue colored vest over his bare chest, blue pants, a strange white colored hat, and sandals he seemed to be struggling with his sleep. Every few seconds came the sound of mumbling from his mouth and what he said was consistent, he spoke of his business being on the verge of ruin because of the weather being a huge problem. I never met his equestrian counterpart so I always assumed Fancy Pants to be a business pony, who pretended he was a high-ranking societal member. Her Highness quickly whispered in my ear that Fancy Pants was the most famous pony, in Canterlot barring the princesses and was on top of every important social gathering. If I had known that from my previous encounter with him, I would have treated him in a much different manner. Still, the fact that he was here with Tyrek didn't make much sense, but there was no use in trying to come to any logical conclusions. The two of them were living together as smithies although Tyrek appeared to be behaving as such what with that hammer in his hand while Fancy Pants was just lazy in demeanor. So he's one of the Canterlot elite? Rarity can't stop talking about him every time we pay a visit there. It must be weird for you seeing fancy pants like this. A little, but Rarity would have gone through one of her overdramatic moments were she to have seen him in such clothes. Twilight said. I couldn't help but chuckle at such a thought, but I made sure not to laugh too loud in case I disturbed his sleep. I am surprised at what he's mumbling about. Oh, about his business suffering. The cold conditions must be a lot worse than we thought. Do you suppose Starlight had something to do with this? Maybe, but it's too soon to say. This weather might actually be a normal occurrence around here or the mountains are experiencing a rare freak storm. Guess that means you'll need to ask either Fancy Pants or Tyrek about what's been going on around here. If you want my opinion, I'd talk to Fancy Pants as Tyrek kind of looks like he might not have much to say given his mouth is covered up by whatever it is he's wearing. Twilight answered, floating towards the couch indicating that I should follow her lead. A part of me wanted to talk to Tyrek given my past struggles against him in Hyrule, but Fancy Pants did seem to be the obvious choice. 
I walked over to the couch and coughed a few times to grab his attention, but he remained fast asleep leaving feeling dejected. That didn't work. He must be a heavy sleeper. Guess I've got no choice but to talk to Tyrek. I said, prompting Twilight to hide underneath my hat. I looked up slightly where Tyrek was standing, and he continued staring off at nothing while clutching his hammer. He was different in this world so I knew that I was safe, so I walked up to the counter before coughing to grab his attention. At first, Tyrek ignored my coughing but then he quickly looked down upon noticing my shadow. The instant he saw me, he started swinging his arms around including the one with the hammer and I ducked down so that I wouldn't have my head lobbed off. Ugok! Ujir Ugo Ugger! Tyrek said. It didn't take long for me to realize that he had trouble talking. Was it because his mouth was covered up or did he have a speech impediment that prevented him from communicating properly? Ugok! Ujir Ugo Ugger! Shut up! I quickly turned my attention towards the couch, and saw that Fancy Pants was staring back at me, hands on his hips, an angry look spread across his face. I was certain he was about to snap at me, but he instead looked at Tyrek, his finger pointing directly at him. How many times have I told you to never do that? What is it about not making any noise while I'm sleeping that doesn't resonate with you? Bah! And just when I was finally starting to have a good dream. Ugok! Ujir Ugo Ugger! I said. Hey! You say that we have a customer? Are you serious? Who in their right mind would come here during this cold snap? Fancy Pants asked. That's when he noticed me standing to the left of Tyrek resulting in him blinking several times before rubbing his eyes. A customer? Well I'll be. I'm surprised you were able to make your way here what with that blasted snow causing problems for everyone. It wasn't easy to get here. I said. I should say, so seeing as you're wearing that get up. You must be either brave or stupid for walking around in that anywhere, but that's just my opinion, kid. Anyway, welcome to the Mountain Smithy, where we take our time to make a good point. That's the slogan we've been using for the last few years. Fancy Pants said. I'm Sunset Shimmer. Odd name, but then I've heard weirder. I'm Zubora, the owner of this fine establishment. You go oh. You go you go. Tyrek said. Shut up over there. She. When I say you can talk, that's when you can speak whatever gibberish you want. Until then, just keep quiet unless you really have something important to say. I am so sorry for that sudden outburst from him. That huge fellow is my assistant, Gabora. He's all brawn and about as smart as a Deku stick. When it comes to forging weapons, he is a natural, but his social skills aren't up to snuff. Fancy Pants said. I was wondering if you had any information. I said. Information? Usually, when people come here mainly Gorons, they ask us to forge them new weapons. I'm not particularly choosy, but I want to know what's been going on around here. You're not the only one. Ugok. You go oh. Tyrek said. Even Gabora, what with his limited intellect, is curious about the sudden cold snap. You see, kid, it never used to be like this. Snowhead has always been known for its cold winters, the Gorons like it a lot better than we do, but this winter has been absolutely terrible to the point where all life is on the verge of extinction. Don't ask me why things have gotten like this as I don't know. You might have better luck asking the Gorons. Fancy Pants said. I had hoped he would have given me more information, but I supposed what he said was better than not getting anything at all. I had suspected the Gorons would know more about what was going on but then I didn't exactly know where to find them. Unlike Death Mountain that had one main path that lead up to their city, Snowhead had numerous paths that lead in different directions. There was no telling which direction would lead me to the Gorons. My only other option involved speaking with Pinkie Pie in hopes she knew something, but like the Gorons, I didn't know where to find her. Looking back at Fancy Pants again, he appeared to be checking a watch on his wrist in between looking at me and Tyrek. I hope you didn't just come here to ask questions, kid, as I'd really hate for my assistant to have to kick you out for wasting our time. Do you know where the Gorons are? Head east from here. You can't miss their village no matter how hard you try. Fancy Pants answered. His eyes then looked towards something that was behind me, and I quickly turned around to see what had piqued his interest. In truth, it was his way of seeing the scabbard on my back that housed the Kokiri sword. I couldn't help but notice that sword you've got there. Kid. I'm amazed someone of your age has a sword but I guess you're trying to see how tough you are. No, you don't need to say another word. 
You came here to get it sharpened so that it can cut even deeper, right? You improve swords. That is what a smithy does. It's a shame really. You came all this way and there's nothing we can do for you. Unfortunately, we're not doing any business right now. It's because of the abnormal cold snap. I'm sure you've already seen the chunk of ice the instant you came in here. We need that hearth working in order to sharpen weapons, and in its current condition, we'll be out of business within the next week or two. I'll bet we won't even last until spring with the way things are going. If I could just do something about that frozen hearth then we can make your sword stronger. Fancy Pants answered. You go oh. You go, you go. Tyrex said. That old story again? You know better than that. No, wait. Of course you don't. What did he say? I asked. He said that hot water should be able to melt the ice, but he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Gabura, you're nothing but a deku stick. Don't pretend that you know anything because you don't. Oh, he believes a rumor that says long ago there were hot springs somewhere in the mountains near here. I personally think he's being more stupid than usual, but maybe the Gorons would know something about it. They know these mountains better than anyone else. Fancy Pants answered. Ugo oh. Ugo you go you go. Tyrex said. Sheesh. You're so loud. I'm sorry that you wasted your time coming here, but unless I can get this ice melted, you're stuck using that old sword. Why don't you come back in the spring when the weather finally clears? We can sharpen up that blade and make it something really special. Fancy Pants said. Ugo uo. Ugo. You go a go go. Despite not earning much in the way of information, I had gained enough that gave me something to work towards. If I could find hot spring water, her highness had suggested hot water is what we needed, then I could upgrade my sword into a more powerful weapon. I thought about asking Fancy Pants more questions, but I could tell that he was in a foul mood, what with his business being on the verge of collapsing. I felt bad for Tyrak due to how much verbal abuse he had been given, but then he didn't say anything about it offending him. In any case, I couldn't do any more here, so I turned and walked out the door leaving the two smithies to do whatever it was they were doing before I showed up. Back outside, the cold weather immediately began to be felt on my body. The warmth of the fire inside the mountain smithy warmed me up tremendously, but now I had to endure winter once again until I could find the location of the Goron settlement. Fancy Pants said I should head east if I wanted to find them, so I walked to the right of the building and resumed my journey making sure to keep myself warm by blowing into my hands every now and again. That was certainly something. Twilight said as she flew out from under my hat. Did Tyrek really scare you? I asked. After witnessing what he did to our fellow ponies, I still have some hesitation towards him. Of course, this version of him must be miserable what with being yelled at all the time by fancy pants, but I guess it doesn't really faze him. Twilight answered. I feel sorry for him. Me too. Do you think getting their furnace hearth will make Fancy Pants treat Tyrek better? It being frozen does appear to be the source of the former's frustration, but we don't have access to any hot spring water. If we can find a deposit, you can scoop some up into your bottle and bring it over to them. You should know, Sunset, that hot spring water doesn't stay hot for very long. I'd say it takes about two or three minutes before it cools down and becomes ordinary water. Twilight answered. That meant if we were to find a deposit that was too far away from the mountain smithy, there would be no point in trying to help them unless there was another way that we just couldn't see. As soon as I walked a few more steps forward, I suddenly came to a stop and placed my hand next to my ear. I could barely hear something that was coming from the opposite direction, but was it worth investigating? Twilight was curious about why I stopped, so I explained that I was hearing what sounded like cries for help. She then floated away for a few moments to see if she could see anything, but quickly came back and shook her head. Perhaps my ears had picked up the howling wind instead of someone calling out to me. I shrugged my shoulders and resumed walking eastward towards what I assumed would be the Goron settlement ahead. How long has it been? It's been about a week now since the Elder left. A week? It feels like he left us an age ago. In these dark times, it fell onto the Elder to go forth and find out what has caused winter to become so severe. Has there been any word from him? The last Goron who saw the Elder was the one standing guard by the village entrance, but he has since relocated to in here to get out from the cold. Only the guard standing on top of the shrine's entrance remains out there, bless her soul. 
I know it was his duty as our patriarch to go out there and find answers, but he should have allowed one of us to have carried out the task in his stead. The cold weather outside is much too harsh for the elder's frail body, so I fear he may have gone to his death. Why did the great Darmani have to die? She was our greatest hero, the shining beacon of hope that lead us through dark times. What did the coroner say when he examined her lifeless corpse? He said that she must have fallen from a great height to have winded up where the others originally found her after she had been gone too long. I shudder to think what had been going on in her mind during that plunge into the abyss from which she fell into. Without her and the elder, the village has lost all meaning. We still have his son. Please don't mention him considering the incessant crying he's been doing ever since the elder left. I can't believe that the elder's son has been crying non-stop for the past week and shows no sign of stopping any time soon. Can you really blame him? His father has left him during a difficult time, yet he wishes to be nurtured in his loving embrace. A child that young shouldn't be forced to endure being on his own. If the great Darmani were here, she could have easily calmed the elder's son down. But she's not here because of unfortunate circumstance. Do you suppose she is watching over us in death? Perhaps, but I think Darmani's soul lingers on the other side due to not being able to rest. Everyone knew how passionate she was with regards to protecting us, and I believe she cannot rest until this situation has been resolved. I'm not saying it's a good thing. Darmani must be suffering in death because there isn't anything she can do. If only we could ask the Great Fairy to bring her back to life. That is something she can't do and besides, that is a forbidden magic. I know, but it would be a miracle if she were to return to us. Darmani is dead and we must accept this even though we wished that weren't the case. What of the Elder? Until we hear from him, we must remain here and keep his son occupied, but it won't be easy due to the incessant crying. Yes, even I am starting to grow weary of the noise that comes forth from his mouth. If miracles truly exist then this would be the ideal time for one to happen. By the way, have you seen that strange human riding the giant bird? That stranger who is waiting near the abyss. Why would a human come here of all places? Their kind are a brave lot if not foolish for thinking they are invincible. We should just ignore him as he probably has a death wish or something for wanting to remain out there in the bitter cold. Besides, we've got problems of our own like trying to figure out how to stop the elder's son from crying. If only one of us could remember how that song went then perhaps we could lull him to sleep. Wow! Talk about an unbelievable sight! I said. Even in the cold clutches of winter, you've got to admit that the scenery looks beautiful. Twilight said. The next area that existed east of the mountain smithy comprised of two islands located in the middle of a large lake. Because of the cold weather, the water had been frozen over completely, yet I could barely make out several small figures swimming about below the frozen surface. There were also numerous snow mounds scattered about with one of them being much larger in size. Perhaps something special lurked within but I wasn't about to hold my breath. What really interested me was the barely viewable red balloon that belonged to Pinkie Pie, yet how could she survive in these conditions wearing only a green suit? Another thing that caught my attention twilight bopping me on the head also helped was a large boulder that overlooked the area. I had no idea why it was up there but maybe it was worth investigating, but the pathway up to it looked mighty steep. I doubted that I could simply run up such a sharp slope. On the other side of the area was a large opening that lead down a tunnel with two large pillars situated on either side. I suspected that the Goron settlement was through that tunnel, yet while I was eager to get going, I knew something didn't feel right Pinky being there notwithstanding. It seemed a little too easy. Perhaps there were monsters that couldn't be seen until you were literally on top of them, but there was no way of knowing until it was too late. There was also the chunk of ice situated right underneath Pinky. Part of me wanted to know why that was there, yet my mind was fixated on reaching Pinky. Given how she functioned in our previous encounters, she definitely knew what was going on around here. Is something wrong, Sunset? This looks a little too easy, Twilight. That's not a bad thing, you know. I know, but since we first got here, the only monsters we've encountered were those two blue tectites that came out from under the snow before reaching this area. I was expecting more than that considering. I said. You should be thankful that you weren't attacked by something much stronger. I'm not itching to fight monsters, but I assumed they would be swarming this region in droves. Maybe they're hiding themselves until I get close enough or the weather is just too cold for them. 
I guess I feel kind of disappointed about it. I said. Yes, I do see what you mean. That wasn't the only issue on my mind. It had since occurred to me that I needed to purchase a map of this region from Pinky. It was the only way she was going to tell me anything but I didn't know if I had enough rupees to pay her. I took out my wallet, opened it up, and looked at what I had collected. If I remembered correctly, Pinky had a map of the current region, and a map of another region that was more expensive. Common sense indicated that getting the map for the current region was highly recommended, so I started counting my rupees. 25. I did pick up some loose ones by cutting grass back in Termina Field, but did I have enough? I also had some spare arrows with which to shoot Pinky down from the sky. I supposed that I could become a Deku scrub again and use a bubble to pop Pinky's balloon, but that would only waste magic. Also, Deku scrubs may not handle cold temperatures very well. Hmm. Yes, I do believe I have enough. To buy a map. Yeah. We could do with a map of Snowhead. Then we should get one from Pinky right away. I said. She was floating above the second island in the middle of the frozen lake, but fortunately, there were a few wooden bridges that connected the islands together. Walking towards the nearest one, I tapped my foot on the wooden plaque several times just to make sure it was sturdy enough. I wasn't being conscious about my weight, I prided myself on being pretty fit for a girl my age but rather I was worried about whether the cold had made the wood brittle. If I fall down to the frozen lake surface below, I'd have no chance of getting back up to Pinky. The slopes of snow that ran down the sides of the islands looked like only a seasoned roller could traverse without any problems. Once I was satisfied that I could make it across, I ran quickly onto the first island making sure to watch every nook in case a monster attempted to catch me by surprise. I ran across the second bridge and came to a stop in front of the ice chunk. I remembered what happened when I accidentally ran into similar ice back in Hyrule. Even a small brush up against it would result in my body being encased for several moments until it shattered. Considering I was already freezing from being out here, getting frozen would only add insult to injury. The most curious thing was the hole situated beneath the ice. Something of importance could be down there, but I'd need to melt the ice using hot spring water. Turning my attention back to Pinkie Pie, who was now floating above me how she didn't notice me below her was unbelievable observing the area, I stepped back a few paces before taking out the fairy bow and aiming it at her balloon. I knocked the bow with an arrow, fired where it sailed upwards, and popped the balloon. Pinky's reaction was the same as it was last time, screaming as she dropped to the ground, knees buckling upon impact. At least the snow was able to cushion my fall. Still, you would think I'd have taken the liberty of giving myself something soft to land on every other time. Pinkie Pie said before noticing me standing next to her. What's this? Green clothes? White fairy? Madam? Are you perchance, a forest fairy? Since I had already been through this routine with her on two previous occasions, I immediately told her that I was from the forest and that my name was Sunset Shimmer. This was the only disadvantage when it came to resetting time. No one remembers what happened, and I'm forced to reintroduce myself to specific characters. I knew you were a forest fairy. I don't know what might have convinced you to come here, but you must have come to see the Gorons in their village. Do you know what's been going on around here? I asked. Sure I do. It's my civic duty to learn about such things and rely that information to anyone who wants it. But before you can tell me, I have to buy a map, right? Wow. How did you know I was gonna do that? You must be psychic or something. Pinkie Pie said. I rolled my eyes making sure she didn't notice. You're very fortunate that you chanced upon me, Mrs. Fairy. Right now I've got two maps that are sure to be very helpful for an adventuring person like you. Surprised? Don't be. It's pretty obvious that you came here for an adventure as why else would a fairy be carrying around a sword? Have you got a map of this area? Sure do. I'll sell it to you for 20 rupees, but if you prefer to have a map of Great Bay, I can sell you that for 40 rupees. I'll take the first one. That'll be 20 rupees. Pinkie Pie announced. I took out my wallet, opened it up, grabbed a handful of rupees that made up 20 in Terminian currency, and handed them over to Pinkie who quickly placed them into a bag she had attached to her red underwear. A rupee symbol was on the front of it, telling me that she kept her money from map purchases among other things. Surely she sold things other than maps inside of it. Yippee. You've made Tingle very happy this day by buying one of Tingle's maps, Mrs. Fairy. I am sure you'll have no trouble finding your way around these mountains. Now that I've bought a map from you, 
can you tell me more about what's been going on around here? Of course. Tingle never breaks a promise and that is always a guarantee. I'm not sure if those smithies back in the mountain village told you anything, Mrs. Fairy, so I might as well start at the very beginning or as close to it as possible. The Gorons have been through a painful experience recently when they lost someone very important. Pinkie Pie answered. Who was it? Her name was Darmeni, and was viewed by the tribe as the greatest hero who had ever lived. No matter what dangers threatened the tribe, she was there to protect them even if it meant paying the ultimate sacrifice. I heard that Darmani had been chosen by the Goron's elder to become the next patriarch, but that's something that will never happen now. About a week ago, a sudden burst of winter seeped through these mountains affecting every last corner of the region. Pinkie Pie answered. I heard from the smithies that the cold wasn't normal. Wasn't normal? I'd say it was a freak accident of epic proportions. Ever since that masked person came back from the path that leads up to Snowhead Temple in the north, this region has been pelted repeatedly with the worst cold snap ever recorded in Terminian history. Pinkie Pie said. I should have known that Starlight Glimmer was responsible for bringing about this weather, but what could she gain from doing so? Darmani, according to a couple of Gorons I spoke to the other day, took it upon herself to go up and investigate the temple, but she ended up meeting a horrible fate. Pinky then handed over a piece of paper that miraculously had not been frozen. On the paper was a drawing of a large statue it certainly looked impressive but I didn't understand where she was going with it. What's this? It's a drawing of the grave marker those Gorons built for Darmani she really was respected amongst them and they gave it to me out of sympathy. Tingle has no need for a crude picture when my own artistic skills are far superior. Pinkie Pie answered. Where is this grave? I want to know because I'd like to offer my condolences. They buried Darmani on top of a high mountain, but the path can no longer be accessed due to the snow covering up the entrance. It's a shame none of them had the idea of getting some of the hot spring water that her grave was built on top of. Go figure. The one place in all of Snowhead that houses hot spring water, and they covered it up. Oh, well. Nothing can be done about it now. Pinkie Pie said. The instant she mentioned hot spring water, an idea began to form in my head. Twilight, who had been listening to the conversation, must have been thinking the same thing. I had to get to that grave site, even if it meant climbing up the mountain. You know, I don't know what became of those Gorons. They were supposed to have returned home days ago, but they're still out there. What about the Goron Elder? Him? I saw him walking down there on the frozen lake, but that was the other day. I don't know where he is now, but I'm assuming that he was able to make it to the temple okay, maybe not considering how slow he moves. Pinkie Pie answered. Maybe I ought to go to their settlement and find out more. Goron Village? That's through the tunnel you see before us. Then that's where I'm going next. I should mention one little warning, Mrs. Fairy. The Gorons may not be willing to talk to you due to a lack of sleep. I know it sounds like Tingle is crazy, but I heard this from a reliable source who happens to be a Goron. Their sleep deprivation is the result of the elder son crying. He's been at it for at least several days now and shows no sign of stopping. I'm amazed they've held out so long, but you're likely to get a cold welcome until they can get some sleep. Pinkie Pie said. How could a parent leave behind their child? The elder didn't want to do it, but he had no other choice. Darmani was their best hope of stopping this cold snap, but she's dead now and it fell onto him to do something. I don't know how much longer they can hold out. Anyway, that's all the information I have, Mrs. Fairy. Thank you for purchasing one of Tingle's maps. Please come by again if you wish to buy another. Tingle Tingle Kololimpa. These are the magic words that Tingle created herself. Don't steal them. Pinkie Pie answered. She then spread her legs apart, clenched her fists, and produced a flurry of confetti before another red balloon appeared from the backpack on her back, lifting her up into the air. Pinkie Pie had given me a lot of information this time around, but it sadly revolved around the passing of an important person. Whoever this Darmani was, she must have been a very powerful Goron to have commanded so much respect from her people. Perhaps if I had come here sooner, I could have done something to prevent her death. No, it happened before I arrived in Termina, so her death was predestined to occur. I then looked up at the sky to clear my mind. Despite not seeing the clear blue skies I was glad that the snow prevented me from seeing the moon I wondered if Darmani could see what was happening. I'd hate to think that she was being tormented in the afterlife because of not being able to do anything to save her people.
it was now starting to become apparent that Termina was a world embroiled with death overlooking everything, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike down anyone it feels deserves to die for one reason or another. The Deku butler's Mrs. Chirili son, Kamaro Zephyr Breeze and now Darmani. Three lives had been lost yet I suspected there were many more out there waiting for me to find out about them. Twilight then bopped me on the head again, was this going to be her means of getting my attention reminding me that we needed to keep going? Just because the village was a short distance away didn't mean that I could take my time. I still only had 72 hours to prevent the moon from destroying Termina. Much like the previous bridges, the last one was just as sturdy, so I walked across and into the tunnel that turned out to be a lot shorter than I was expecting. Upon exiting the tunnel, Twilight and I were shocked at what we were looking at. Goron Village looked like it extended forever what with how big it was, and how the far end consisted of nothing but a blank void of space the snow did limit my vision so perhaps I couldn't see everything. So the Gorons live here? Twilight asked. This place is far more spacious than Goron City was. I answered. Am I to assume that you're talking about a location in Hyrule? Yeah. Goron City featured narrow passageways that went in all kinds of directions. I don't know how the Gorons were able to live in such cramped quarters, but they never once complained about it. Seeing how big this village is really shows just how different both words truly are. I answered. Just make sure not to fall down on the ice. No need to tell me that. I said. The thought of falling down on my rear because of the ice was the last thing on my mind. What was on my mind involved feeling sorry for someone I didn't even know. Darmani was taken away from her people and that has had a negative effect on them. Did it was a reflection of how life itself was short, and so we have to make do with how much of it we get before moving on to the next life. Just thinking about such thoughts sent shivers down my back. I don't see anyone around. They might be inside somewhere. It makes sense that they would prefer to stay inside where it's warm. I'm sure we'll find a Goron if we look hard enough. I said. It actually didn't take as long as I initially thought I guessed several minutes and it was several seconds as standing a few hundred meters away on the other side of a narrow walkway was a Goron. I couldn't tell if it was a male or female Goron, but they were wearing a helmet along with a breastplate that didn't appear to fit on their body very well. When I saw their kind before, they resembled humans who wore clothing that was Amazonian in nature. Now I was seeing them for what they really were, creatures that looked like rocks. Since the walkway was made of ice, I had no intention of using it in case I were to slip and drop down to the floor below. Luckily, there was a wooden bridge nearby that went around a longer path, but I preferred it instead of the more dangerous path. The Goron hadn't noticed my presence so they continued standing more like shivering so I walked over to the bridge and across making sure to keep an eye on them. Twilight had no qualms over me wanting to use an easier path as she didn't like the thought of me falling down. Upon getting to the other side and walking up to the Goron, they turned to face me and I could see that they had been outside in the cold for quite some time. Having pieces of ice hanging on your facial features was a pretty good indicator. My mouth then dropped upon recognizing who was standing before me. It was Diamond Tyra. Her Highness once told me that her equestrian counterpart had since become much nicer, yet that might not be true with this version. Hey? A human? Someone actually made it here in one piece? Diamond Tyra asked. The cold weather didn't do me any, I answered, but was quickly cut off when Twilight bopped me on the head. I was annoyed at how she interrupted my conversation, but the look on her face made me feel concerned. Sunset? Do you mind if I take this one? Twilight asked. I'm not sure if she would want to talk to a fairy. Maybe, but I'd like to talk to a character for a change instead of you. I know you're the hero of this adventure but I'd like to contribute in ways that don't involve me simply giving you advice and pointing out the obvious. Twilight said. I never knew Her Highness felt so passionate about it. I supposed it was something I never really considered before, and for that I felt guilty about not giving her a chance to express her desires. There was no way I was going to deny her what she wanted, so I stepped aside with a wave of my hand. I know this is awkward, Sunset, but I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Just do what you usually do. If you mean a lecture, I think a more direct approach is in order. Twilight said as she floated in front of me before stopping inches from Diamond Tyra's face. Excuse me, but I hope it's okay for me to talk to you. Oh. Hey, fairy. I haven't seen one of your kind around here before. Usually, you're up there with the rest of your friends at the Great Fairy's Fountain, but I can accept you wanting to get away from there considering the temple has been nothing but a major pain for us Gorons. Diamond Tyra said. 
I was wondering if you could answer a few questions. Make it quick, okay? The weather around here continues getting worse, and while I'd love nothing more than to inside where it's a bit warmer, I have to stay out here as the guard of the Goron Shrine until my relief replaces me. Diamond Tyra answered. My friend and I have heard about the passing of one of your own. You mean, Darmani? Yes. We also heard that she was buried somewhere in these mountains. Do you know where exactly? Well, that's something we Gorons wouldn't normally share with outsiders, but your kind do live on this mountain as well, so I guess it's okay for me to tell you. The burial site for the Great Darmani is located in the mountain village, but the pathway is no longer accessible. Unless you were to climb up to reach her grave, I'm afraid you've got no reason for going up there. I wish that I could have gone up there to give her a burial worthy of her greatness even though she was stoic in personality. Diamond Tyra answered. There was something she said that sounded familiar, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I tried to figure it out but the sound of crying made it difficult for me to concentrate. The noise didn't appear to be phasing Diamond Tyra, so had she gotten used to it or was completely ignorant. Do you hear something crying? I was hoping you wouldn't have noticed, but then the elder's son is known for having a loud wailing voice. He's been crying non-stop ever since his father left a week ago in order to find out why Snowhead is being bombarded with so much snow. We've tried everything to calm him down but nothing's worked. Diamond Tyra answered. She then looked at me for a few moments before turning her head in the opposite direction and mumbled a few words. I had no idea what she was saying, but it felt like she didn't appreciate me learning about something that had nothing to do with a non-mountain native. I'm sorry, but I can't say anything else about it. What? Why not? It's a Goron matter. While I have no problem seeing a human around here, outsiders knowing our business is a bad precedent. That strange human in the green outfit already knows way too much as it is, and she doesn't even live in the mountains. Sorry, but I'm not going to say any more to you. Diamond Tyra answered. She then turned her face away from me and resumed her shivering from before. I could understand why the Gorons didn't want anyone from beyond Snowhead to know about their way of life. Granted, she did act like a complete jerk, but she most likely was told not to tell anything otherwise she'd get punished. There was no point in trying to get Diamond Tyra to say anything more about what was going on. It was something that Twilight and I had to figure out on our own. Thanking her for what information she did provide, I walked past her making sure not to make eye contact, and resumed walking down the pathway. Had the cold weather changed the Gorons' attitudes towards outsiders or was this something they had always been known for? As I was thinking about how Diamond Tyra behaved, I failed to notice the icy floor ahead of me. The instant I stepped on it, I slipped, fell onto my rear, and slid down the path where it went around a strange building before I landed on my face in a large clearing. Climbing back onto my feet and brushing off loose ice chunks, I began to look around to see if I could find a way back up. Ahead of me was an endless chasm with an island situated quite the ways away. How was anyone supposed to get over there without wings? Also, why weren't there guardrails to prevent someone from plunging off? You would think the Gorons would be more inclined to keep themselves from dying. I can't believe how rude Diamond Tyre was. It didn't bother me all that much, Twilight. I got used to people treating me badly, especially after the fall formal when I was exposed as the monster I was. I said. Sunset. I'm better now than I was before, yet there are times when I look bad on what I did, and wish that I could have done things differently. I said. That's when I noticed something really odd and stepped forward in order to confirm my suspicions. There was a shadow in the middle of the clearing near a wall, yet what was even casting it? Nothing within the immediate vicinity was producing a shadow, and Her Highness and I had our own underneath us. What's this doing here? I inched slightly closer and sensed some kind of presence hanging above the shadow, but maybe the cold had really gotten to me. A shadow without anything attached to it? Is it danger? I don't know what it is. Sometimes the most mysterious thing can turn out to be the most obvious. Wah! I shouted. I looked around upon hearing Flash Sentry's voice in hopes of figuring out where he was. It took me a few moments to figure out that his owl was perched on top of a tall pillar with him sitting on the saddle. Even when I try hard not to freak out whenever I encounter him, my efforts prove to be in vain. Flash always caught me by surprise even when it wasn't intentional. Once I regained my composure, I folded my arms and gave Flash a stern look. My apologies for surprising you. Flash Sentry said. I really wish you wouldn't keep doing that. 
This is only our second encounter, fairy child, but again, I apologize for making you uneasy. In any case, it is fortunate that we have met again. Have my stone statues been of help to you on your journey? The more of them you have activated by striking with a blade, the larger your horizons shall become. Flash Sentry said. It has made traveling around Termina much easier. To soar through the skies like a bird is truly an honorable experience. Flash Sentry said. His owl companion suddenly thrust its head forward to get a closer look at me. I backed away several steps in case it tried to attack me, but then it started tilting its head left and right before turning it upside down. I knew owls were capable of doing that, yet it felt really creepy, especially because it was much bigger than normal owls. Flash noticed his companion glaring at me and whispered something that caused it to pull its head back. My owl was merely observing you, but perhaps his gesture was more towards intimidation? In any case, it seems you may have the strength to change the fate of this land as I had expected. You doubted me. Many claim they can change fate, but only the strongest of heart can do so. I must warn you, fairy child. The road ahead is even more challenging. Many trials await you that shall test your limits, yet they must be overcome. Please watch over these Gorons around you. Their land is doomed to be smothered in snow and ice forever. Should the evil that pervades these mountains continues to thrive, it will become a land where no living thing can survive. Without courage and determination, you surely will collapse from the extreme conditions, and become a forgotten relic. But if that courage and determination burns bright within you, then that's another story. Flash Sentry answered. He certainly had a lot of expectations about me, but some of his words felt like they were insulting my abilities. I know that I had struggled in the early going of this journey what with trying to get used to using items that I had never used in everyday life, yet couldn't he have been a bit more sympathetic in some regards? Even though this was Flash Sentry, the guy who still had a crush on Twilight, I had to remember that he was portraying a different character. Speaking of Her Highness, I wondered what was going through her mind right now. I knew she still harbored some romantic feelings towards Flash, but then she hadn't seen him in person for quite some time. Did she still have those feelings or had she moved on? It was something I couldn't just ask her to confirm. She needed to express such feelings at a time that was convenient to her and no one else. I've come this far, so I might as well keep going. You are a child of many strengths. Perhaps you do have enough strength to change the fate of this mountain after all. Can you see the island that exists on the other side of this chasm, the island that cannot be reached through normal means? Flash Sentry asked. He then titled his head towards the island I had noticed earlier. I knew there was something about it that felt odd, but now it seemed there was more to it than I originally thought. My companion shall take to the air now, flying towards the shrine located within the cave on the island, so follow behind me. Do not be daunted by appearances. Instead, let your feelings guide you, and the true path shall open before you. Flash then urged his owl to begin taking off by using its great wings to pick up air currents. I had to struggle to prevent myself from falling over due to how powerful the gusts were. The owl then began flying over towards the island, yet I wished that he had taken me with him. How was I supposed to make it across if I couldn't fly? Twilight could easily make it across as she had wings, but I was forced to come up with a means of making it over there. I folded my arms and began thinking hard on figuring out an answer, but then a timely bop on my head from Her Highness made me realize what was going on. Flash's owl was losing its feathers as it flew across to the island whether it was intentional or not remained to be seen yet while some of them drifted down into the chasm, others landed on the air itself and remained in place. How in the world was that even possible? Unless, there was something there I couldn't see with my eyes? What do you think, Twilight? There must be some kind of invisible platforms that are allowing the feathers to remain suspended like that. Flash did say that you need to let your feelings guide you, so I'm guessing you need to trust in them and hope that you don't plunge down to your death. Twilight answered. Why did she have to say that? I already had plenty of pressure on my shoulders what with saving an entire world and restoring another one back to normal. I didn't need for her to mention anything that would make me feel even worse. However, she was right about me needing to rely on my feelings. That island was important for a reason so getting over to it was my immediate goal. I inched closer to the edge and peeked down at the chasm below and boy was it massive. I doubted that I'd hit the bottom instantly if I were to fall in, but then I couldn't allow my mind to think of such horrible thoughts. I had to take a risk, so I leapt from the mainland towards the first feather and landed on what felt like a chunk of ice. On the one hand, I'm glad that I'm still safe, but on the other I wished that it could have been anything except for ice. I sighed and looked ahead to see where the remaining feathers had fallen. 
each one had fallen the exact same distance apart from each other, and that told me that each subsequent jump wouldn't be all that challenging. I did have to aim for each one correctly as the notion of plunging to my death was still apparent. Calming my nerves and leaping again, I landed on the next invisible ice chunk and continued in that manner until I reached my destination on the final jump, I landed face first in the snow and quickly picked myself up in case my display made Flash think otherwise of me. I have certainly been assured of your courage and determination. From here on, you must not be fooled by appearances. You must rely on your feelings otherwise you will meet an unfortunate end in the future. Now, enter the shrine before you. Flash Sentry said. Is it a shrine dedicated to the Gorons? I asked. The Gorons have known this island to have existed beyond their village, but none of them have ever set foot within it. Something that will aid you in your quest lies within a wooden treasure chest. Use that item when returning from here. You will be able to find your way back, and you will understand the shadow. Flash Sentry answered. He urged his owl to rise once again where it began to fly off in the distance. I had no idea as I would ever see him again after this point, but I was grateful for his guidance. Twilight didn't need to say anything. I knew that I needed to go into the cave entrance and get something that was inside. I had a feeling I knew what I was going to get based on how I was able to the island. Walking into the cave without any hesitation, I was expecting to go through a series of chambers in order to claim my prize, but instead it consisted of just one room with a chest situated at the far end with two boulders on either side. It seemed quiet at first but then the shuffling sounds of monsters coming from above was a dead giveaway. Skull Tulas! Twilight said. Do you think I could avoid them by going straight for the chest? They only come down when something enters their territory, so you might be able to avoid a fight if you tread carefully. Twilight answered. I looked up at the ceiling and saw that there were two Skull Tulas, yet I couldn't tell if they were looking down at me or not from their vantage point. It was true that I didn't want to fight them if it could be avoided, so I slowly stepped forward making sure to remain in a straight line. The Skull Tulas began to shuffle as my presence in the cave finally caught their attention, but they remained on the ceiling most likely due to me not being a threat. While a mad dash would have been beneficial, it wouldn't have done me any favors other than being drawn into a conflict. Upon reaching the chest, I quickly looked up to make sure neither monster decided to drop down for an investigation, they didn't so I was relieved. I opened up the chest and peeked inside to see what it was that Flash Sentry insisted would be helpful to me, and when my eyes caught sight of a familiar object, I just had to roll my eyes in response. Never thought I'd see this thing again. I said as I grabbed and pulled out the object in the chest. It was a purple-colored magnifying glass with a strange eye symbol in the middle of it, yet its most distinguishing feature was the lens itself having a blue tint on one side and a red tint on the other. Flash Sentry was right about it being useful. Guess I shouldn't have doubted him just because he's Flash. I am surprised that it's become available a lot sooner than it did when I acquired it last time. As I gazed at my new item, Twilight flew about in a tizzy and I knew she wanted to know what was special about a magnifying glass. This is the lens of truth although some call it the eye that can see the truth. When I use magic and gaze into the lens, the truth becomes known to me. It can show you the future. No, I didn't mean to say it like that. It can reveal things that are either invisible or aren't really there. The truth can be a powerful thing but you need to make sure not to abuse it, Sunset. There are some things that are immune to the truth, and attempting to figure them out would only be a waste of time. Twilight said. What about that shadow we saw outside? You think that item will reveal something? It couldn't hurt to try. We need to get back over to the mainland anyway in order to continue, and I can show you just what this thing can do. The magic I gained from a dojo will enable me to see the truth, but I can't use it too much or else my magic will be drained. I answered. Walking back outside running would have brought those skull tulas down on me from above the feathers that dropped from Flash's owl were no longer there, but I raised the lens of truth to my eye and looked forward. Come and take a look for yourself, Twilight. You can see what I used to make my way across initially. Twilight floated down in front of my face and peeked through the lens to see the ice chunks. How they were floating in thin air was a question neither of us could answer, but she was amazed at how something so simple could show so much. Now this quite the fascinating magic. I knew you would be impressed. Magic like this doesn't exist in Equestria, but if it does then it's a kind that almost no pony uses. It might have been a star swirl the bearded thing. If anyone in Equestria could use magic like this, it would be him because after all he, Twilight said before cutting herself off. Her eyes opened wide in horror followed by her jaw drop that prompted me to check to see if she was alright. Sunset. 
I... I... I can someone or something standing on the mainland over there. I thought she might have gotten a little intoxicated from witnessing such a magical display, but when I looked through the lens to see for myself, I almost dropped it. See? I told you there was something over there, but I can't make out what it is. Well, I was going to show how the lens of truth works, and now's a really good time. I said. Without a second thought, I began jumping across the ice chunks. They were actually small platforms making sure to keep looking into the lens so that I didn't accidentally jump into the chasm. I only had one life instead of multiple lives. While it looked like I was making it look easy, I was having a mental nervous breakdown. Upon getting back to the mainland, I dropped down onto my knees and began kissing the snow as that horrible ordeal had come to an end. Glad that's over. You didn't need to kiss the snow. Be in my shoes and you'll understand. Fair enough. Now, what about the strange person we saw while peering through the lens? Twilight asked. I had almost completely forgotten about that. Gripping the lens firmly in my hand, I looked through it to see who or what was making that shadow, and this time I dropped it upon seeing who was standing there. Twilight was surprised at my sudden reaction and started bopping me on the head. Sunset. Sunset. Are you alright? You look like you've seen a ghost. You've got no idea how right you are. What do you mean? Twilight asked. She then hovered down to my face and looked through the lens of truth before rubbing her eyes. No. This is impossible. How could that have happened to her? Sunset. What in the white world of Equestria is going on here? I had no answer to give her. How could I? What I was seeing was impossible in my opinion, yet there was no trying to deny that we were seeing the ghost of someone who was very familiar to us. Standing floating actually with her usual blank stoic expression was Maud Pie, yet I knew straight away she was different from before. She had a large gaping wound across her chest and aside from wearing a bra and ragged shorts, she wasn't wearing anything else. Unlike other Gorons who were brown in color, Maud was gray and transparent. How did she get that wound? More importantly, how did she die? What was I going to say to Pinky? The only way to know for certain was to ask and hope that she would respond. Hello there. I said. Maud didn't respond, but that was because I didn't use the lens of truth to properly see her. Raising it to my eye, I could see her again. It was actually difficult for me to look at her in her current condition and she simply floated there without any emotions on her face. Hello. Hello. I was wondering when you were going to take notice of me. Maud Pie said. It's kind of hard to do that, since you're a ghost and all. I have been watching you for the last few minutes going over to that island and back again. That doesn't sound creepy at all. The one who was riding on top of the large bird told me that I had to wait here for the one who would help me to come. He said the one I needed would have the power to see spirits through eyes that can see the truth. It feels like I've been waiting forever, so I am glad that you... Mod Pie said. Flash Sentry told you to wait out here in the cold. I do not know who this Flash Sentry is that you talk about, but the cold weather that spreads across my village no longer affects me. After all, I no longer can feel anything since my body passed away some time ago. Mod Pie said. I clenched my teeth upon realizing I said something that offended her. Either she didn't take notice of it or did and was really good at remaining calm. You are the first person to have seen me for quite a while now. I had been waving my hands around hoping anyone would see, but they were not able to gaze upon one who no longer lives amongst them. She then floated a few paces and I managed to get a better look at the wound on her body. Whatever did that must have been incredibly powerful, but then why would she want to fight anything bigger than her? You are looking at my wound. I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable. No. It's all right. I received it when I was protecting my village from a rampaging Dodongo many years ago. The wound never properly healed and became scarred. I like to think it reminds me of when my people turn to me in their time of need. Mod Pai said. The wound itself looked like it may have reached down to the bone, but I was afraid of asking in case she changed her mind and took offense. I'm sorry, but I ended up going off topic. I would like to focus on what is really important. Oh? And what would that be? Since you can see me with strange magical powers, you may be the one who can help me. What do you want me to do? Not here. Hey. I wish for you to help me in the proper location. Please follow me to the place where I was buried by my people. You have the ability to see me, so you should be able to keep up with me as we travel through Snowhead. Mod Pie answered. 
was she being serious right now? She wanted me to follow her to her grave. Why not simply ask me to help her here and now rather than drag across the entire region? Before I could respond accordingly, Maud turned to her left and began floating away. Standing there like a statue won't do either of us any favors, so please follow me and try to keep up as best you can. This had become a real dilemma. Should I follow Maud Pai to her grave or should I stand my ground and insist that I help her here in the village? End of chapter